If you can stop talking for 10 seconds, that would be fantastic. You want to hit the start timer on there? You want to hit... You want to start podcasting, genius? Biff, do you remember which of the knights of the round table came up with the first delivery app? Uh, no, but I think you're going to tell me. Uh, surcharge. Was surcharge. Not one of the better known knights, but uh, Surcharge was the first one to come up with a delivery app. Next. Hey, you know, Biff, uh, you know why you know why uh why Eagles have such low self-esteem? Why do Eagles have such low self-esteem? They're bald. <laughs> Joe <laughs> Joe Where's Joe? Where's Joe? Hello everybody. And welcome to Carnival Personnel Podcast. I'm Jacques. Get out of here, Biff. Joe's in town. That's right. That wasn't Biff. It was me. The Mimic. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I I just Scooby-Dooed you and pulled <laughs> the, the plastic mask. It was Joe the whole time. And I wouldn't have gotten away. I would have gotten away with it if it... Uh, you lie, George. You lie. Let's do it over. This okay. time, you be right. Biff. You ready? Okay. You start. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a great knock-knock joke. You go first. <laughs> uh, so there, there's a screw-up, a thousand percent on my end. Biff might be uh, uh, jumping on, but uh, time zones and math is hard for me. I was um, told there would be no math. You know, and... Uh, uh, and and I woke up from my nap just in time to have Joe wake up from his nap. And I think because I screwed up the space-time continuum, Biff might be right now taking his nap. But hopefully he will jump on. Uh, but in the meantime, Joe and I got so much to get into. I'm going to start off by saying we had Steve Bjork on the Very podcast good. last week. We've had so many fantastic guests over the last couple years, especially, and it's amazing. And I, because I've fallen down this comedy rabbit hole, just love talking comedy with comics. And it's, it's, it's a free master's class every time I get to come on my podcast so I can pick your brains about how this machine works. The conversation with Steve, the feedback that I got instantly, like the next morning, how long have you known Steve? How long have you guys been friends? Because so many people said, you, you, Steve, and I sounded like you, Biff, and I. Like it was just another conversation with people who've been hanging out for a very long time. Yeah, I liked Steve. I um, didn't really know his stuff. Sorry, Steve. Sorry to break the news to you. I didn't really know your stuff when you before you came on, but... Um, since then I've, I've, I've grown accustomed to your humor and, uh, yeah, I think he was just a real good, um, storyteller, uh, real pro, um, stand-up comic, by the way, for those of you who didn't listen to the sideshow, shame on you if you didn't, by the way, it was a fantastic episode. So, but yeah, I, I'm, 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 I like your little, um, you know, the, the byproduct of you hitting this midlife crisis and having to, you know, go on this quest to conquer stand-up comedy has brought you to this sort of little pocket of, um, of nightlife and of, uh, of comedy, of the comedy world that you're now bringing into our world. You know, you're, and I like it. I like it. we're meeting all these new people. And I like that some of the people who we've met have since left <laughs> and gone <laughs> to other places. Well, that's a, so I'll touch on that in a second, but I'm going to round out with Steve. 
the comic before we had on was our friend, you know, Jenny Howell, who's Jenny Millions on Instagram. And she's fantastic, you know, yoga studio owner, uh, yogi, and a very, very funny comic. When I reached back out to Steve, Steve, like the day I had reached out or the day after I reached out, he was um, doing a show with Jenny and mentioned it. And she was like, yeah, I just did their show. Those guys are great. So she had forwarded him the episode she was on. And so by the time he talked to us, he like we, we had some street cred from somebody that he likes and respects saying it was a lot of fun. And then, and then they tell two people. Right. And then they tell two people. Well, they told more than two people. So I, I don't check, quote unquote, our stats. I don't go through our analytics. You don't go through the metrics, man. I really don't. I mean, I know I'm I'm a little more active on the socials. Well, I'm less active on Twitter and more on Instagram the last few months for a myriad of reasons. But I don't really follow. Oh, this is a way to get more followers on Instagram. Oh, this is a formula when you should post, when you should do that. Look, I saw this funny video. I'm putting it in my timeline. I heard this funny thing. I took this picture of this comic I was with last night, put a funny caption. I'm putting it on my time. That's what I do. But it was nice when I recently was posting Steve's episode. I think because some of these comics haven't done podcast or, you know, whatever, um, or have followings and they posted it on their social medias. The last few comics we've had, like, you know, Paul Bort, uh, Jenny Howell, Steve Bork. Bjork. Bjork. I, I have trouble. I, I, I know how Got to it. say it. I, I literally, it's my, it's my um, speech impediment. Because like we even joked about it, I know how to say it if I really slow down and enunciate. It's like, I, I, like I put on the episode, like the singer, but not as weird you know, <laughs> was the title of the episode. Uh, Do almost a quadrupling and a, a tripling, uh, not a quadrupling of normal listeners, hmm. which I didn't feel bad. Whoever listened to Steve Bjork last episode, who's now tuning in to only hear us talk about talking to Steve <laughs> Bjork. And if they get past this little, uh, you know, uh, little, little soliloquy of mine, I will be shocked. But I, I, and I also talked to Steve. I'll be honest. Bjork. At the end, <laughs> <laughs> you are not a good person. Uh, you're punching down, Joe. You're punching down. Uh, at the end of most of our podcasts, you know, three out of four podcasts, I play one of my band songs, or I play one of my band's old songs, <laughs> or Mike singer solo stuff, or old bass player John stuff. Anyways. I'm very proud and I'm taking credit that five weeks ago we released a new song called Tucker, all about Tucker Carlson. And it's written from the point of view of a proud boy about his hero, Tucker Carlson. It is our born in the USA. Mm -hmm. It is our uh, Randy Newman's short people. And people lost their shit on Randy Newman for punching down and going after short people the whole point of the song written by somebody who's five one <laughs> is that it's just as dumb to hate somebody because they're black as it is because they're short it came out in the mid 70s and people just misinterpret it uh dan the most brilliant lyricist i ever knew in my life and i mean that uh his last song all about building the wall same thing if you listen to the chorus it's our born in the USA. Um, so that said, Steve reached out to me and said, hey, what was the song at the end of the episode? I'm thinking, oh, no, please. Oh, no, please. <laughs> you know, uh, middle-aged white guy. He lives in a town where there was, for four years, a branded Trump store. One of those stores where you could buy every, like, literally – and and my wife has friends in that town, and she follows that town's Facebook page. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of Karens, a lot of well, anyways. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no. And he's like, yeah, listen to it a second time. And then I got what was going on. That was great. Can you send me a copy? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. But then I saw Jenny at a mic on Tuesday that she normally doesn't go to. We hung out, and she and I 
again, we're talking about some of the people that we've had on that she's friends with and fans of, and she just loves Steve as much as we do. And she was like, yeah, he put me up so many times and been a, been a real, been one of those people who've gone out of their way to give me breaks, to give me book shows, to really kind of help me along, which is great. And then I saw her on Wednesday, uh, and, and, and which Steve came up again. Um, so 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 thank you very much to steve bjork mm-hmm. uh management is going out of town pretty soon and i might and in lieu of you coming over and watching 1974 episodes of car sharks mm-hmm. maybe you and i we can wrangle my sister who's the one who got you know me down you know into steve fine you know go to one of his shows because mm-hmm. he works every friday saturday sunday you know, one of the weekends, management's out of town. We will go see Steve. Now, okay. moving on. Enough about you. What about me? What do you what think do you of me? me? <laughs> uh, I got asked recently uh, by somebody from uh, – yeah, I've been talking to Lil Son about doing an article and about some of the work that I've done in this, this comedy thing. And I had a couple great conversations with the, um, with the writer that, you know – I'm not saying I don't want you to do a profile piece on me, but there's a bigger story. Over the last six months, there's been this comedy explosion. And you know better than almost anybody. When I, pre-pandemic, I mean, just before it started, do you remember trying to help me find open mics? Uh, Yeah, there were fewer and far between. Yeah, they were. like It was like, oh, here's three in Boston. And then I think there's some in New York City. And then, (laughs) you know, there wasn't a lot. I I think you found one on like a Wednesday night in Quincy, which is (laughs) at at six o'clock to get there for sign up from my house. What, two hour window, hour and a half minimum. Yeah. But to be fair, a Wednesday night is Quincy night in Massachusetts. (laughs) It's so true. And there's nothing. Well, now. There's been this explosion. And even when I started down this eight months ago, I I really started in November of 2022. Uh, I had to go out to Worcester because I only knew of one open mic in Worcester on Tuesday at Ralph's. And now in my beloved shitty of Lowell, there's three or four weekly mics. There's three or four monthly mics. Mondo Comedy was the only booked show. Only only book show where a name comic came to town, got on stage, cost 20 bucks to get in. Now there's two or three booked shows a month. And there has been this explosion. And I'm talking to the writer about it. And I'm like, yeah, you look at the places that are having these mics. They might be shut on a Tuesday night. Now all of a sudden there's 30 people for three hours. That It's worth bringing in a bartender and opening the doors and, you know, like the safe, I, I can't think capacity is safe as more than 30 people, like legally 30, 35 people. There are sometimes there's 35, 40 people in there, you know, for a few hours. Hmm. And now the monthly show, and, and what's great about the monthly show at Coffee and Cotton inside mill number five is that's produced by a college kid. And when I started consulting with the owner of mill five a couple of years ago, mill five is this indoor mallish place it's kind of like a hipster douchebag place it's very eclectic it's awesome joe and i have hosted a couple retro video game fundraisers there that went incredibly well so i've been dealing with the owner and one of the things he said is it's impossible to get the umass lowell kids off the campus and come down here we're a mile away it's a huge city it's the biggest property real estate owner in the city Thousands of pounds. I don't know what the enrollment is, but hey, they're a Division One hockey team. You know, I mean, they're a legit big school. Nobody from ULO. And why would you? The campus has so many theaters and groups and, and activities going on. But there's a comedy producer, young kid, who is producing book shows on campus, bringing outside talent in. He also runs this monthly mic at the coffee shop at Coffee and Cot inside Low Five mill five which gets college kids in i mean he's cracked the code and last so yesterday i had the big sit down with the writer from the lowell sun i had told her 
it's driving the economics of our community and it's great. And then I said, what I personally love best about this community, it's being driven by such unique and different voices. It, it's so many, and I hate to say women comics, but there's so many women who are not just getting up and doing these mics, but are driving booked shows in the town. There's so many people of color at these mics specifically here because i go to boston and do mics and surprisingly it's not as diverse as in lowell i go to mics out in worcester that essentially you know it, it, it honestly it, it, if the, you know there's a couple guys great comics but if 15 people go up there might be one mixed race person you know what i mean maybe 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 you know, a black guy drove in from Boston to get an extra mic in. But generally speaking, it's me, you know, just, just, you know, but younger versions of me and douchier versions of me. So in Lowell, you know, you have, and, and again, there's so many people I've really have got to the point where I'm not calling them acquaintances, fellow comics, but absolutely people I consider good friends at this point who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And, when the writer said she wanted to do a profile about this, I said the profile should be about this comedy boom and how it's positively affecting the numbers in this town and helping businesses. And on Thursday, I told her there's a mic this Thursday from Cotton Coffee from 7 to 9. And then three, four blocks away at, at, at Concept 6, this art gallery, you know, restaurant bar, there's a mic that goes from like 9 to 1 in the morning. And half the comics here will walk over and do that. And the, half of them will stop by and get a coffee here, grab something off the Colombian food truck parked in front of City Hall. But these comics who are putting the hours in, are grinding it out, are also spending money at these places. Their friends come by to see them. And I said, that's the story, that there's been this comedy boom. The, in New England, that there's a boom in Manchester, there's a boom in Worcester, there is more mics in Boston, but in our city, it it has exploded, and it's exploded with these wonderful voices. So we put together, I reached out and had a bunch of these comics that I like from these different communities, these different voices, and we talked for an hour and a half with her. Uh, the guy who is the events coordinator for mill number five sat in and what really I think, you know, seeing is believing. I went to Greg, Bog uh, Greg Bogus's Mondo comedy show last Thursday. And as I walked by uh, the coffee and cotton, the, they're in the same facility, 745 last Thursday, there was one guy on a laptop in the dining area of the coffee shop at 7.45 on Thursday night. Yesterday, it's the first time they hit 30 people had signed up to do the open mic. Hmm. Wow. You know, not everybody brought a friend, but the guy who runs it had four or five of his college buddies there. At one point, there's 50 plus people in that area where we did the first retro game video thing. Otherwise, packed. And so here's the writer who I had sent that picture to last Thursday. I'm like, this is what this place looks like right now. File this away. You will see for yourself that it's not smoke and mirrors. When I say it's an, it's an economic boom, it's an economic boom. So uh, that profile should come out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I will post it on all our socials. It was such a, a fun talk. Um, and it was really, you know, we, we talked about some of the really support. There's so much competition. There's only so much booked shows. And it's one of those things where, you know, we've talked about, it's like, yeah, I'll see a person get this book show and think, oh man, how come I'm not getting book shows? I'm not doing anything this Friday. I'm still going to go see him and support him. I'm going to go see her and see her show. You know, it's like, yeah, you're competing for those, those few book shows here and there. At the same time, it's been you know, a, a more welcoming community than some of the other ones that I've been privy to, you know, going through this midlife crisis, <laughs> you know, over the, over the last few months. So, well, good for you. I'm glad that you're, you know, the way you've made, you've taken lemons and made lemonade and, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. I, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, uh, be on the sidelines, uh, way past 
the five way past the the the, uh, the, the sideline, like way in the back, like three rows back in the sidelines, looking at you having um, this experience. And uh, yeah, I will um, be the first to give you all the credit for injecting this um, this shot in the arm for the Lowell comedy community because you know before you started doing this, it wasn't a boom, and now all of a sudden. People are seeing you go up and saying, "Hey, if this asshole can get up there and do comedy, then <laughs> you know what? I, You're like bringing I, the people out of the woodwork." Is what I'm saying. Like I said, we uh, Dan and I released our song about Tucker Carlson five weeks ago. Three weeks later, he gets fired. Coincidence? It takes a lot of work to make a coincidence. Is what I'm I, saying. And well, it, what's funny is. There was this one great guy, you know, uh, Ian Michael Sargent, who runs, who just started running. He was great on I Love the 70s, by the way. He really was the best. Oh, no, that's Michael Ian Black. Sorry. Six of one, two dozen the other. Uh, Who a few weeks ago started running his mic for the same reason. Like he wasn't loving a lot of the mics going on and he's running a mic in Worcester. He sometimes comes down to Lowell. He came to Lowell last Tuesday and There was something in the water that night, and I had posted it, and I had talked about it. Hands down, the best night of open mic that I have done so far, and I've done close to 70 of these. It was absolutely, everybody, everybody brought their A game. It was fantastic. And I had talked to a bunch of pals, and I'm like, hey, Ian has a mic in Worcester tomorrow. Why don't we go out? Four or five guys from Lowell went out to his mic in Worcester, and it's just starting. So he's having... Eight to twelve people. So when four or five extra show up, it's you know it's it's it was a big night for him out in Worcester. And then this past Tuesday, five or six people from Matt Mike and Worcester came to Lowell, you know, to do it. So the safe this week, like I said, absolutely packed. And then the same thing, uh, our, our our buddy Paul, you know, who did the the comedian who did the uh, Borat who did the um, podcast about four weeks ago. Uh, who's getting ready to go to Denver. He doesn't usually come to Lowell and do it. I'll see him in Manchester. I'll see him in Somerville. I'll see him in Boston. But he and a bunch of people came to the Coffee and Cotton mic yesterday. Like I said, it was the first time they hit 30 people. Um, So it is. I mean, it's literally Lowell is becoming uh, this place. The local radio station that – a few months ago, I mentioned I kind of slightly went to war with because uh, the morning people, they're really all white people, mostly broadcasting to the shut-ins at the assistant living facilities around Lowell, no social media. I ended up going on a couple months ago with a fill-in Friday morning person who's great. Oh, by the way, uh, at, this is a station that Al Caprillion phones in the new, uh, phones in the weather. He's not in studio. Phones it in, and man, do I mean phones it in. <laughs> he literally phones it in. Uh, so I went on to promote the show of Mondo Comedy I was doing and became friends with this woman, and her and I, in conjunction with support of the radio station, are now planning on doing a comedy fundraiser for a local vet who runs a PSD outreach program. Um, so, hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, am I king shit on Turp Mountain? No, I am not. But it's nice that now the radio station is involved and the college is involved. And I, it was funny because the college kid who runs the show needed a ride. I have to drive through the campus to get from my house here. I'm like, Sean, I'll come pick you up. I got the phone call from the radio station. I said, well... It's funny you reach me now because the guy who produces this show I'm going to is going to help us produce that show. And he's looking at me like I am. I'm like, yeah, you know. Uh, I like that you're also not only reviving the local stand-up comedy scene, but you're also helping to revive the um, the industries of newspapers and radio. Because, (laughs) I mean, I think there were more people at the Coffee and Cotton last night than, than listen or read. The, either the publication or that radio station because, you know, the internet changed things. A, a little bit. And it is it is not lost on me that... Uh, 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 Are you going to go do a public access show next? or <laughs> Actually, it's funny you say that 
because one Broadway collaborative, the mic that I do in Lawrence, is at a public access studio, and they broadcast the Monday night shows. Wow. So they burn I, all that gold on the airwaves? It, dude, I'm dead serious. And they, what was the other place? Yeah, so I guess there is – a monthly live cable access stand-up show now and lol because somebody said oh you have to come on this show next month uh-huh. i'm like do i oh, so man. yes it's the 90s all over again baby we got radio we got newspapers i mean wh- which zine are you going to be interviewing with next or- dude oh, actually oh again i'm at the one broadway collaborative uh, inside the cable access studio in Lawrence, and I'm like, oh my god, this fan scene still exists. There's a, it's like called Metronome. It's a Boston area music fan scene that Beyond It was profiled in many a time in the oh 91 to 95 years. Like, like literally, there's oh. got to be 10 issues in a bin in our pool shed somewhere where you know where you know with all the billboard stuff and all the, all the fan scene stuff and all the yeah i mean that was 30 years ago how oh crazy is that dude right and i'm thinking well howard stern is the king of all media right he gave himself that much i am the king of all dead media yeah, yeah you're the king of x media <laughs> <laughs> oh my god dude Seriously, in the last month, yeah, I've done a cable access show. I'm doing with a newspaper. Are I'm, you? I'm, I think you're going on vaudeville tours, dude. Too. I told you. <laughs> uh, did, did I? Did, did I have to say, or was it correctly assumed? It's an AM radio station. I'm talking about. <laughs> I thought that, it was ham radio. So that's actually a. Only oh, when I'm on it. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> well, that concludes this podcast. I don't mean this episode. <laughs> I, I think we're all. Does that mean we're killing podcasts? Does that, I think podcasts are now a passe. And now that we're actually involved in it, uh, dude, it's so bad. Uh, and then there were. We're no- coming for you, TikTok. We're coming for you. <laughs> so, just before we uh, we start recording. Go ahead. Oh no! Yeah, no, you, you're. I, I trampled your segue. No, you no, I, I, I don't have a rundown. No, I was no, just no. excited to go to see Saturday Night Live next week. Oh you know? well, you know what? That worked. That worked. So, wait, I haven't. I, I honestly, I've been so excited. All I've been doing is sort of burying my head. I don't even want to read the news. I don't want you want to look at the news. I don't want any sort of spoiler to you know my experience. I want to learn what's going on in the world when I go see Saturday Night Live next week so i'm yep, looking yep, forward no, i'm to gonna it. pick you up you know what i mean yep. uh-huh. it's gonna be fantastic so what joe's alluding to is uh we had a whole podcast i think devoted to this my cousin nephew yeah he's my cousin technically but age thing he's always been kind of like a nephew is it right on saturday night live and he got tickets for me and my beloved who oh, is uh you who is we've been waiting all season to go he, he invited us right away and I, i'm like dude you got more important people you got to wine and dine and you know you you know use these tickets to have your agent's friend who's pitching a show that you might need. anyways i'm like we'll get there when we get there i wanted to go love to be supportive but i just know he's in a position where every person he did a high school play with 16 years ago is hitting him up for tickets and stuff. So I'm like, dude, if it happens, it happens. He got me and my wife tickets for uh, May May 13th. And that's great for Joe because, you know, May 12th, my wife gets on a plane to go to Vegas with two of her best friends for a Mother's Day weekend. So these moms are all leaving their families to go to a 90s like rock festival with like 30 bands and so i had to say oh my god that really sucks oh i'm so sorry yes i get to call joe and i called joe and we were all excited and uh joe hasn't seen the news so joe's uh, blissfully unaware that there is a writer strike wait what Come yeah. again? Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. It's uh, huh? There is no joy in Mudville because it's just the West Coast, though, right? Just it's just the Hollywood writers, right? That doesn't affect the New York writers, my just the comedy ones. Oh, I see. 
because I only follow comedy shows so, <laughs> as far as I know and all oh, the effects. Oh no. Oh yes. Oh now I you know what? I now I remember. Yes, I do remember seeing something on what's it called? The internet about the writer's strike. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? These things blow over. It'll be like a it'll be like a dream. It'll be it'll be over in a week. It'll be great. You just drink a little bleach and the writer's strike will go away. Uh, people came up to me say, you know, tears in their eyes. Don't worry. Sarah. Right. It's, it's... I threw them some paper towels. <laughs> I'm going to go away. You can write on this. Here's your money. <laughs> yeah. So there's a writer's strike. Uh, uh, and so it means uh, no joy for Joe and I. I. I did instantly. As soon as the writer's strike was official, I texted Jimmy and I'm like, Oh, I can only get you tickets on this day, a week after a writing strike is looming, knowing I don't actually have to see you when you're not coming up. <laughs> and, he, and he wrote back into it. He goes, oh, my God. If I had any idea, I would have done that with everybody this year. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to put you on yeah, May 13th. I'm going to sit you in the front where you're going to – you know, you want to be in a sketch? You know? Right. <laughs> I did ask – do we still get to drive out and go to the after party? Can I can can I show up at two a.m. somewhere and hang? are they picketing on Saturday night? That's what I mean. I'll join the picket line. I don't mind. You so know. instantly, I the, we went back and forth. It was funny. I'm like, I'm envisioning a bunch of Gen Sears wearing tweed jackets, holding absolutely obnoxiously ordered Starbucks coffees, holding very funny signs, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he's like. Yeah, that's pretty much what's going to unfold uh, later today. And then you saw you 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 were you were reading some signs to me early. If you still have those, oh yeah. The, so on Twitter there was a, a feed with all of the uh, some of the funnier signs like uh, Succession without the writers is just The Apprentice, and look how that worked out. <laughs> um, what was the other one? Uh, you, you you can't spell TV without writers. Um, <laughs> uh, pay your writers or we'll spoil succession a lot of succession humor uh and uh yeah i mean it, it it yeah i mean like that's the that's the uh bright side to a writer's strike is that they have these big picket signs that have white spaces that they can write the funniest uh things in there uh pay us or i will climb the wb tower and release the animaniacs i swear to god <laughs> uh, give up just one yacht just one. Um, the writer. I have a family to feed. Studios. Who told you to have a family? <laughs> and um, then, then there's somebody drew the meme of the two buttons and somebody sweating over which button to push. One button says, pay writers a little more. And the other button says, rebrand HBO Max again. Um, and what yeah. you pointed out, I forgot it, it went from... What, what did it start at? Oh, Before. it was... Yeah, they... I forgot. I almost forgot that HBO Max didn't start off as HBO Max. It was HBO Go, and, and, and then there was no, no. Then it was no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was HBO Now. HBO Go was the app that came with your HBO subscription. And then when they launched a sub, 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 subscription only thing, that's when HBO Now came into play. And and what did it become a clusterfuck because? People thought they were signing up for, oh, I, I, I got this program. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. You have the mobile version of HBO. You can only watch it on this. It doesn't come on your smart TV. Or if you signed up for it on your TV and you're trying to log into the app, it's like, no, you can only watch. But, you know, yes, and it, it, it was a big clusterfuck. And then they kind of, then they, yeah, they even even out. And then they started like offering like really HBO Max was one of my go to streaming things and still kind of is you know barry is season four is on but uh, i'm glad they produced and, and and shot that prior to the writer's strike because oh man i could not wait another year for that to conclude but yeah it's a it's a real bummer and you know the writers are striking by the way for speaking of streaming um more money to you know pay writers for the content that they've been producing for years on streaming services because you know, long and the short of it is that the producers of these uh, shows or or, the, or the, the people who run the streaming services are treating, they want to, you know, gear it, the writers to more of like a gig economy, like, you know, kind of a pay, get paid as you go kind of thing, you know. 
And um, the writers are like, wait a minute, you know, you, you're you're making money, you know, hands over fists, and um, you know, you're still treating this as sort of like a, you know, like a 2009 internet model right. of the internet. So hold on, you look, you're making some great points. I'm regurgitating most of them. You're regurgitating some great points, but I'm trying to think who I would want to loop in this. I think maybe. I think maybe if I could get George Bailey to step up to the mic and explain <laughs> how the economy how the economy works. Because some people are buying and some people are selling, but I'm not <laughs> sure how that model works. If if I can text him to see if he can jump on. Let me see if I can get a hold of him really quick. Uh, you're, you're, you're thinking of the the, 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 you know, you're thinking of this place all wrong as if we, we have like the, the the money in a bank or something. It, it, the money's not here. It's in it's in it's in Netflix and it's in uh, HBO Max. It's a, <laughs> you're gonna foreclose on them. You know, hey, Fred, you you borrowed passwords from your your buddy to to watch uh, to watch a uh, Mrs. Maisel on Prime. I mean, we can we 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 we, we can get through this. We've just got to stick together. It's so stupid. It's, dude. The dumbest thing I've you know, ever done. You know, you know, the, the, the studios are are are, are, are oh, yeah, selling the bunny. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. What's it going to do? Yeah. Hulu isn't selling. Hulu, Hulu's <laughs> buying. And why? Because we're panicking and they're not. No, we, we can get through this. Yeah. I. Uh, by the way, that speech was written by a writer. What? Yeah. That wasn't an ad lib by uh, Jimmy Stewart. No. That was uh, written by on a script by a writer. You know, tell, if you read that on the internet, that's was written by a writer as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but that's um oh so whatever. Here's a controversy that maybe never come to light. Controversy. My my wife uh, management her she has a lot of husbands. John Mulaney is her comedy husband uh seth myers is her late night husband so she went to watch seth myers the night of the writer strike and something funky happened uh, sometimes you, you you go to record something and you're recording too many things at once and it might stop recording this and it supersedes and records that or whatever something funky happened and like a chunk of seth myers was missing and she went back and he's like starting to give a monologue he's talking about the writer strike and then it's like 15 minutes later there's a guest you no know, talking and you know she was kind of what the hell happened on her way into work two days later she if she doesn't watch and she doesn't watch it all the time at night because she goes to bed at a reasonable hour because she has a real job because she's a grown-up because she doesn't play PO for <laughs> eight hours a day uh, you like yeah look look resident evil 4 doesn't play itself joe no and it takes a dedicated player like you and so she loves his podcast because it's 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 not the guest, but it's the the new the the monologue and the um a closer look. That's okay. the segment that he has. Yeah, it turns out that Seth Myers had a very long soliloquy. Some soliloquy. Thank you. Some uh, thoughts. Oh, that were maybe not broadcast on the national broadcasting company. And it's akin to when we lived in Qatar, you couldn't have kissing. Period. Uh, it's just that you know what i mean it's like and hmm. you go to a movie and and it wasn't a surgeon going in and oh okay well it won't affect the story if we cut here and come back here they would just heavy hand it take out three minutes before and two minutes after it was very hard to go to movies and watch them there um and and that's what they did and it's weird because i don't know if he has control over his podcast and that NBC doesn't own it, or they didn't think, oh, wait, we should also strike this from the record. But he had some thoughts on it. And wow. and and that's – so I went back and I watched, you know, because it's still on our – I don't know if you call it I, – I call it TiVo, or, or we recorded it. DVR. DVDR it. Uh, and I watched it. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what they did. Somebody at the network said, nope, 
and just cut the monologue and it cut into the the guest already on the couch like like not even the introduction maybe he made a joke as the guy was being as the guest was being introduced but somebody at so, the network made wow. that so decision you, what would what was uh you don't know what was said like it wasn't revealed or was oh, it no the- he did i mean he he was saying everything that you were okay. everything that you just regurgitated as you yeah. said everything that george bailey just brought to light is pretty much what he said yeah. and i'm going to start the hashtag free seth myers i i think we're gonna get <laughs> you know Let me see oh if I- man that's uh you know i mean it's bad enough that you're on a 10 30 7 a.m you know it's worse when they, you know, ch- you know, truncate your monologue because of censorship. That is literal censorship. But, right. You know, right. I, I yeah. mean, that's. I don't know. I guess you know. They, I, I, I wonder if he'll address it. You know, when when they come back. And it's interesting. You know, one of the few bright spots of the last writer strike is that Conan, John Stewart, and Stephen Colbert every night went on the other one show they would do these skits where they were running from one studio to the other with each other or be mad at the other one for being a guest on their show because they were sitting in the studio thinking conan was going to come to colbert are you are you hammering something what's happening over there i'm hitting the table you're mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore (laughs) yeah i mean i i i i did like seeing the I was reminded of the clip of um, <clears throat> of Conan O'Brien trying to kill time during the writer's strike on his show by spinning his wedding ring and trying to break a record of how long he can get the wedding ring to spin on his desk. And uh, he couldn't do it. It was like, you know, I think the, the, the record was like 41 seconds and it was off camera. But then when he tried to do it on camera, it was only, you know, 36 seconds. It was a big disappointment. Very big disappointment. So, But, yeah, that's the entertainment we have to look forward to if this writing strike nope, goes they're much longer. pulling the plug on all of it. Like, Seth Meyers isn't going on. Jimmy Fallon. I don't know if they're all, but there's a lot of them who are like, yeah, we're not doing it. We're not just not going on. I, I mean, I, it's commendable because a lot of those guys are going to try to pay out of pocket to keep their writer or to keep their staff um, paid. So as of now, as of now, yeah, the network is going to pay Kimmel and uh, Meyer's staff for two weeks, and then they've pledged we will pay a third week. Yeah. But if the writer's strike goes 100 days like the last one. Yeah, I mean, they they will, you know, that's what happened the last time. They were the those shows went on hiatus for three weeks or whatever. And then they finally like, no, we need to feed these people. You know, like they need we can't we got to do something. So it's kind of like, okay, well, let's go on without writers and, you know, muscle through. I don't know how the stu- I don't know how Seth Myers or how NBC, Peacock, whatever it is, Seth Myers has handled his staff over the last year. But Seth Myers has gotten COVID twice. And in the middle of production. And mm-hmm. so I mean they've been shuttered more than they've been on the air the last three months. Yeah, that's um that's pretty bad. You know, maybe you should go see a doctor. <laughs> right yeah. i mean come on i mean i'm just supposed to get superpowers after you get covid one time you, you got a, a second time so let, let's uh let's segue into some real awful but not get into it too deeply um it's funny and it's not funny somebody on a show that i listen to in the morning sometimes uh the stephanie miller show uh another i listen to it out of an am radio station out of chicago but it originates out of los angeles and She's okay, but she, the, her staff is really funny. Like, uh, it, it's funny because you know, I I wish they let this girl be her own person without every time introducing her as Carol Burnett's daughter. But anyway, it is what it is. They have all the same guests on that you see uh, at MSNBC at eight o'clock at night, but they have them at eight in the morning, and it's more relaxed because it's a comedy show. But they put together like a three-minute montage, which was tough to listen to, but it was a three-minute montage from January, after January 6th, of all the Fox news people going down one by one, soundbite after soundbite, week after week, month after month, saying like, well, this, 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 this is an insurrection. 
this is an insurrection. This is if, if this is an insurrection, how come nobody has been charged with um seditious uh what is the term seditious conspiracy i think mm. is the term they're like because that's that's the fancy way of saying treason and they're like uh, and when they did start it rounding people up for breaking an entry for unlawful entry for a, you know more than loitering and then and they started with the smallest crime and started working their way up the ladder i'm not a fan of merrick garland i i I, I won't get into that, but he did say from day one, they're going to find everybody who was there who was part of these crimes. And the people who killed the cop, the people who beat the cops, the people who bear sprayed the cops, the people who broke the windows, and the people who smeared shit on the offices, like literally not figuratively, the people who thought it was a great thing to carry a Nazi flag and a Camp Auschwitz shirt. And one by one, they found these people and they did jail time. And some of them are doing real jail time. I mean, real jail time. But at the same time, methodically, carefully, because seditious conspiracy is one of the toughest crimes to, to convict somebody on. It's it's hasn't happened like you can count the number of times people have been convicted of of seditious conspiracy on one hand in the last like hundred years. It was that that Jewish couple in the sixties oh, who yes. who were spies who got and, and Rosenberg. Got, yeah, the Rosenbergs they got the death penalty. You know, I mean, it's very, very hard, which is why it's one of those things. It's like they're the DA, the prosecutors will plead down. You know what I mean? Uh, because it's the, the the bar that they have to meet is so high. Well, it was a couple months ago, the leaders or the Oath Keepers, the absolute top branch of the Oath Keepers, I think it was five or six of them all convicted on all charges of seditious conspiracy. Mm. This week, the Proud Boys upper echelon has been, and and when we talk about the walls closing in and will they ever close in, will there ever be a comeuppance, will, 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 you know, stone. Will we ever get a morning after? <laughs> you know, well, you know, all the people who got pardoned, after being convicted, you know, will they actually get convicted? Because you can't convict them on the old charges. But when Merrick Garland said, we're going to work our way up, and, and it takes longer to put together the cases against those people, Here, you know, here's somebody who got swept up in the moment, who was just loitering, who didn't break the doors, but, you know, went in. Uh, and we're inside, like, the Capitol building when the riot was going on. It's like, yeah, they got swept up in the moment. They got a little too excited. They shouldn't have been there. They got 30 days. They got two weeks. They got – and then at the more serious people, it, it went up. And the people who killed the cop, the people who, you know, more, you know wounded the other – you know, wounded for life, the other people. Mm -hmm. and, but now – and, and it, it is. And a lot of the people who got convicted were not there that day. But they were the ones who planned it. They were the ones who organized it. They were the ones who paid to get people from point A to point B. Now, there's a lot of other people who we know for a fact took money out of their pocket and said, I'm going to fund these buses to come from point A to point B. I'm going to work it out with this person, that person. So when we say, yeah, those people are never really going to get their come up, I don't know because – the fact that they charged these people with these crimes, knowing the burden of proof was so exponentially more demanding, and the fact that they not only met the burden of proof, they got convictions now on a dozen people of the of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, and the next the, the next run up is the you know Roger Stones and, and and the other people, and the fact that we know. Just this past week, Mike Pence, who had that one moment in time, we will always be thankful for. The longer these cases have gone on, the closer it actually came to working. If the guy at top 
who's gone bankrupt five times, who bankrupted a casino, wasn't so incompetent and didn't surround himself with such incompetent people, the plan almost worked. And if Mike Pence got into that Secret Service vehicle that day, if Mike Pence didn't certify the election, it literally would have been more catastrophic. Now, he had that one moment, a broken clock's right twice a day. Ever since then, He's wish-washed about, yeah, he should have said those things, but he's never full-throatedly said, the president sent people to kill me and my family. The, the people who brought a gallo and, and were chanting, hang Mike Pence, were sent here because of that. He fought on every level possible up to the Supreme Court to not have to testify, and he had to testify and give a deposition this week. What he actually said, we don't know, but... We keep waiting for Merrick Garland to to really the January sixth thing, the stolen documents that we now it's it's clearer and clearer that were sold to Saudi. Um, those you know the, the Georgia election, you know it's like the old Lenny Bruce. Who are you going to believe? Me, your own lying eyes. We heard the phone call of him saying, "I need you to find seven thousand one hundred and four votes. That's all I need you to do. Go find those votes to the governor of a state." And yet, the, there's been no come up. And but I really think the seditious conspiracy convictions. Now, this is the second round with a second group of people. Uh, will. At the same time this week, the last couple of weeks, we found out there's been some shenanigans with good old Clarence Thomas. And this week, uh, you thought it was bad two weeks ago. It's just come out today as we record this. It turns out that that billionaire who owns Clarence Thomas, uh, he sold himself into servitude. Uh, it turns out we found out two weeks ago that that guy bought Clarence Thomas's mom's house and let her live there rent free until she passed away. Uh, quite noble. I mean, hey, it happens. The rich guy who owns Domino Pizza found out that Rosa Parks was behind on her rent and getting evicted and paid her rent for the last five years of her life. And that didn't come out until that guy passed away. So, you know, that guy, you know, helped out Rosa Parks. Hero. This, this, this guy's helping out, you know, Clarence Thomas mob, you know, yeah, of course, hero, uh, white savior. Uh, at the same time, it turns out that that guy was also paying uh, the private school tuition for Clarence Thomas's children. It, it was one thing that, oh, I didn't have to disclose that I went on yacht boats with him and then he flew me around the world for fancy parties. Uh did have to disclose that. But, you know, I hope Judge Roberts steps in. Oh, wait a minute. I'm being told that Judge Roberts' wife for two decades has been the go-to realtor for a number of different uh, white collar. Not, uh, what are they called? Not white collar. Um, uh, God, there's a term for, for like these really disgustingly huge law firms. Ah! Silk stocking? Is it silk stocking? Anyways, hmm. um, yeah, she's the go-to realtor who put together some really, huh, that's interesting that you're paying that much money for this property because they're only asking this and you're paying four times that and you're giving a 10 times fold the normal commission to Judge Robert's wife. Oh, wait, the same week you have business in front of the Supreme Court. Isn't that interesting that Judge Roberts has not come out and spoken out against Clarence Thomas because uh, it turns out, you know, I mean, what if George Soros had been paying Judge, you know, Kajanji, I can't say her name, and it's, again, it's not uh, an ignorance thing. I have a speech paper where I can't say certain words and names, but Judge Jackson's children's Oh, private yeah. school because george soros as we all agree he is the one that paid for the jewish space lasers he is the one who he is the cash, shadow government cash. Right, cash, right dude now I, I saw the venmo transaction like he was paying the engineers on the venmo trans oh wait that was matt gates bringing on agents still so, okay but yeah i mean the the stuff with the conservatives on the bench like people have been asking yes Brett Kavanaugh, awful person, but he had, he was upside down like some $250,000 in debt 
a week before his confirmation hearing. And somehow, I don't know if he got a job like as a short order cook in Denny's, but those bills went away overnight. Like, you can be surprised how much money you can get from redeeming cans. No, you can't. Yep. Like, yes. No. Yeah. So, so that's it. And it, hey, but at least, at least, at least we got the media to make sure they're, they're that last line of defense between like, you know, seditious conspiracy taking over and the fall of Western. Hold on. What? I'm told that, wait, Leslie Stahl had Marjorie Taylor Greene on. Yeah, we knew that. What? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, wait a minute. It turns out CNN is giving an unfact checked town hall to wait. This can't be the guy who was just indicted in New York on fraud charges uh, a couple weeks ago. Wait, is this the same guy who's in the middle of a rape charge? Huh? Yeah, it is. It turns out I just want to fact check. Uh, they're giving Trump a town hall and part of the deal for Trump to do this town hall on CNN versus another network, they will not fact check. Okay. They've pledged that they now maybe afterwards they'll fact check, but in real time, they're giving 90 minutes for him to sit there on CNN and give a town hall in front of handpicked people. Oh, wait. Oh, with the writer strike, I don't know if Goebbels is going to be able to <laughs> write the speech for him. And I think Goebbels would cross a picket line to 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 write this town hall talking point. So yeah, he's not a union man. He really isn't. Um, you know what? Enough of that. It's horrible. Uh, we already did a self indulgent theater. Thank God. Within a self-indulgent theater, <laughs> this show is the self-indulgent theater inside. I know. A self-indulgent theater. Um, but, you know, uh, sports don't exist anymore. Great. Uh, Resident Evil 4 is all my life is about. You playing anything? Um, not uh, Nothing to speak of, I don't think. I, I've been kind of, uh, you know, tinkering with my retro game consoles. I recently upgraded a uh, an older Nintendo model that, to a, like a better video quality because I'm bored and um, I'm I'm also going through a midlife crisis. So, you know, I'm slowly chipping away at my savings by um, buying these little, you know, retro modding kits, um, you know, putting my soldering skills to work. I fixed the uh, power switch on my Atari 2600. So that's also good. Um, but no, I'm not really playing anything like um, that you would care about. Um, but I'm glad to hear that Resident Evil is making you happy. I'm waiting for the new Legend of Zelda to come out for the Nintendo Switch so I can buy and not play that. Oh, <laughs> no, you will. You will play, play that. A little, a little no. bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, how much did you play the last one? Uh, maybe like 25 30%. You know, I didn't finish it. I think I think maybe I got halfway through. Maybe it, halfway is through. that the one with the Robert Williams Easter egg? Maybe. I don't know. It's the one, you know, the one that came out on the Switch. But I don't know. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's a great game. It's one of those like open world exploring games, and um, it's uh, yeah. So the sequel's coming out. I think what, two weeks from now. But um, yeah, we shall see. I have not seen the Mario movie yet, so we will hold off talking on that. But I have seen, and it's only a minute long. Is it the greatest thing that Mark Hamill has ever done? No, but Mark Hamill just shot a commercial with the actor who stars in the new Star Wars video game, and Mark Hamill is on set coaching the actor who's in a motion capture suit on using the Force. <laughs> and look, no, it's not Empire Strikes Back, Mark Hamill. It's also not Corvette Summer, Mark Hamill. So uh, it's somewhere in between those extremes. I cannot stress enough to go to the YouTubes, go to the Twitterverse, go to Instagram, you know, put Mark Hamill, like, you know, I, with Jedi, what is it, commercial? Jedi, but, is it Fallen Order or something? Fallen Order, or just put, like, commercial, and I'm quite yeah. sure it will be the first thing that comes up. Seriously, I love the fact that, and again, Mark Hamill 
is killing it. He's doing great. He he's you know the Burt Kreischer movie he has coming out. I mean, just absolutely amazing on the Mandalorian, all that stuff, yada yada yada. Um, but the fact that he's kind of also has this Leslie Nielsen kind of okay, I can make people happy by reprising this role, and I can make people also happy by kind of mocking the reprising of this role you know because at one point in the commercial the the actor and the most captioned suit turns and goes you know i can't really use the force right <laughs> you know because jedi you know, survivor is the game it, 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 it the commercial for jedi survivor mark hamill is uh my new happy place my other new happy place in, in the tv world um uh, the latest episode of uh, Titans has dropped on um, HBO now. No, so sorry, HBO Go. Sorry, sorry, HBO Max. Uh, sorry, is it still HBO Max or is it Max yet? Is it HBO it, Max? It's, it's just HBO Max for now. For now, yeah, okay. I think it's, I think it's the, the 23rd or the 30th. I don't know. But at the end of the month, it'll be just Max. But the, and then uh, it'll be just shit. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to chop away all the good stuff that we like about HBO. But they on. really are. They probably are. I mean, it's funny that they pulled all the stuff and they put it under one roof. And it's like, oh, we're taking this off Netflix and this off here. And Anyways. Mm. Uh, but my my happiest thing I've seen in a while. And this is, eh, look, I, I don't want to say it's for a niche audience. But episode 11, season three, the new episode of Titans. It's one of those moments where. There's a couple character reveals and a couple character, you know, interactions that since the series has started that people have been saying, I can't wait till we get to this part of the Batman family tree folklore when this person becomes this person, this person meets that person type thing. And it was very satisfying. It, mm -hmm. They, you know, they've, they've, they've I don't want to say reimagined imagined some characters, but they've. They've added some things to people's backstories that uh, I'm really good with. You know what I mean? It's like, wait a minute. You know, people who didn't follow the comic books just accepted Nick Cage as being Nick Cage. Um, Samuel L. Jackson as being Nick Fury. Uh, Nick Fury is white in the comics. But yeah. the thing is, like, he was a BC list character. And the comics, he wasn't the beloved Ariel where there's outrage that you made <laughs> Ariel black. Like people who were like were big comic book people who maybe not like big comic book movie people. But, you know, the Marvel movies transcended the normal superhero movie audiences. You no, know, the same thing. You know, in this they've reimagined and it's like, you know, my favorite Robin is Tim Drake. And, you know, my favorite superhero is Nightwing. But isn't he Robin? Yes. He's the second best Robin, but Tim Drake is the best Robin. I I haven't lost sleep that they've made him black and bisexual. You know, it, it hasn't it hasn't torn down my love of this. It didn't ruin your childhood. Fictional character, <laughs> you know. Well, Tim Drake didn't come out until after they killed off Jason Todd. They didn't kill off Jason Todd to ninety one. I apologize. I'm going to stop talking. No, no. I, I when I said ruin your childhood, I knew. That it, this, we're talking about '90s characters, which were <laughs> well beyond your childhood. Arguably, but, is but it, it actually was the it, it was it's still in the realm of your man childhood. So you know, it's like a technical. Anywho, right, let me I, look I, at the I, expiration I, date on that. Oh, never! Yeah. <laughs> I I will never forget that. You know, when management came to move out to LA. Uh, Immediate members of my family who were friends with management before I knew her pulled her aside and said, we're not bad mouthing my brother, but uh, keep in mind, you're not the first woman to move cross country for him who left a shallow husk of the person they were because everybody thought, oh, this is cool and charming. He has his boyish quality. I'm going to fix that. <laughs> Ooh, I love a project to say these women. <laughs> Oops. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it was my brother or my sister, but one of them had pointed out, keep in mind, Peter did not leave the island with Wendy. <laughs> that, she, <laughs> that he stayed in Neverland as she returned to the real world. So yeah. 
I wish you the best of hope and happiness. I might not give up the apartment so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so uh, uh, lessons learned. But uh, yeah, I as for myself, uh, thanks for asking. I have, um, <laughs> I I'm also watching TV, and I you know, I'm I'm getting my I'm making my way through the uh, the, the latest season of Ted Lasso season three. Um, I'm up to like episode six, uh, one of the best episodes they've ever had. And, um, I'm looking forward to the, the remaining, you know, whatever handful are left. Um, I like the, uh, I like the, I like the relationship between, uh, Roy Kent and Jamie Tart, um, and the way that they're evolving that, um, it's surprisingly Ted Lasso's kind of taken, I mean, Ted's stuff. He's a, he's a real he's a real enigma in this season, you know. Like there's a lot of stuff going on that's, <clears throat> and it's also like knowing some stuff about the personal life of Jason Sudeikis is also kind of mixing in with my thoughts on how Ted Lasso's being uh, portrayed this season. So it's it's so it's it's great because I'm up to date on Ted Lasso, and I'm also watching season two with my little guy who's getting caught up. And just like we've talked about before, in season one, episode one, yes, of course he would be nervous because he's thrown into the press conference after a 14-hour flight and sleep-deprived and thrown to the wolves for nefarious reasons by the team owner. And and he's nervous. And, and there's a couple moments where the audio, if you've ever been concussed, it's that sound where you're kind of underwater and you hear the voices, but there's this sustained loud hum through it and it cuts to his hands and is trembling a little bit. Well, the story unfolds over the course of two seasons where two seasons later you realize it's daddy issues, cut from personnel episode four. Um, <laughs> And and he has a breakdown. He has a breakdown in the middle of season two, and then he deals with his mental health issues. And it, it it was fantastic. It was great. It was wonderful. But it's funny how they plant these seeds. Also, I don't know. It's episode two, episode three, season one, where Ted's assistant coach is waiting at his front door for Ted to come down. And Ted's like, oh, I'm sorry, I overslept. He goes, oh, but you got down here really quick. He goes, yeah, I don't think it should take a man – Longer than the song Easy Lover by, oh, she's an easy lover, Phil Collins oh, yes. and Philip Bailey. So flash forward a year and a half laser later, season two, episode nine, Ted's getting ready to go to Rebecca's dad's funeral. Easy lovers, and he's it's not like, oh, they're just playing this in background. Ted is listening to it and singing along as he's getting those little seeds. And so what's really interesting, without giving too much away of season three, it's very interesting when Ted is first reluctant to embrace therapy with Dr. Sharon and says, Oh, have you ever done therapy before? I said, Yeah, my wife and I did. And she had been seeing a therapist for a while. And then it became, you know, marriage counseling, but it always seemed like I was being ganged up on. Like, you know, the therapist was on her side and it was like a let's beat up Ted and go over all the things that why Ted's a bad person type thing. He spelled that out. And then it's just so funny to, and again, a year and a half later to see, 10 episodes later, they, they mention it in passing kind of once. And then what happens a year later? I, I mean, I know they don't write the entire episodes or the entire seasons three years ahead, but they definitely have some long-term planning. And again, yeah, with what's happening in Jason Sudeik is, you know, real life, it, it, how can it not spill over? You know, how can there be not be correlations? So, yeah. And um, the other thing I'm watching is, um, as Barry, the final season of Barry, um, the, I'm I can't wait for Bill Hader to direct a movie because that's his next, that's the next logical step. You know, he's, he's wrapping Barry. He directs a lot of the episodes. He obviously, you know, co-writes a lot of the episodes. Um, he stars, and this is the Bill Hader showcase. We've seen 
amazing things that he's been be able to do with just storytelling, just like the the visual medium. You know, like as a director, Bill Hader is legit. You know, um, and as a writer, he's he's fantastic. Um, and even as a performer, you know, like he his character is scary and crazy and hilarious. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of the best characters to have been conceived this in the past 10 years you know or 20 years or i don't know maybe <laughs> i don't want to say ever i mean I don't, he's not like that uh i don't know how i don't know how impactful barry is going to be in the grand scheme of things but the show barry itself is great it's not like breaking bad you know great, i don't know up if there i look i think breaking bad Again, Breaking Bad was also on a cable, so it, it was able to reach a larger audience faster. But I think Breaking Bad has become bigger as time has gone on. Look, they just did a Super Bowl commercial this past year right. with a character who was killed off in season one. What? Spoilers. And so, <laughs> so that character was killed off in 2012? 2013 i mean almost mm, so that show further back right 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 when did the show run god you know what you so, the fa- so the fact <laughs> so the fact that the show has been over for five or six years yep. and the fact that this character has been off the show you know in season one it's been at least a decade but because people have found this show because it has staying power because it's you know it it's Almost Breaking, Breaking Bad wrapped in 2013. It, 2013. It, it, start, it started in 2008. Okay. Wow. So 2008. Wow. Well, well, my kid's born late 2007. So that's yeah. crazy. 15 years ago. And so this character was killed off 15 years ago. And they dig him up and they revive him to do the commercial. I mean, that's how impactful that that guy was 15 years later. And he was only in four or five episodes. But. Yep. But that's because of the staying power. I think Barry finds a larger audience as time Later. goes on. I I really do. I think it's one of those things where people will be like five years from now, be like, wait a minute. What happened to uh, uh, oh, Mr. Who, who is who's Henry Winkler's character? Uh, yeah, Gene Cousineau. We don't know. I don't know what happens to, to you know. Mr. Cushnow, but it's like maybe there's a Jesse Pinkman type five years later they do a store, you know, a one off movie with him because it only grew in legend and staying power. Um, and by the way, Henry Winkler is fantastic. You know, I mean, like, yes, this man, is, you know, he's the Fonz, but he was also, you know, um, it, what was it? Was Gene Parmesan? Was he was that his character on, on Arrested Development? All I know, I don't remember his name, but when that character jumped a shark. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they even did, they did a bit where he they were like meeting in a men's room. And then like, I think it was uh, him and Jason um, uh, Bateman. Yeah. And uh, Bateman, so Jason leaves, the, he leaves the, 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 the men's room and he leaves um, Henry Winkler alone in front of the mirror. And he goes to coma's hair and he pauses and then he just like looks at the mirror like he's perfect. Like he does the Fonz <laughs> thing in the mirror as his character from Arrested Development. Fantastic. Anyways, uh, I don't think that'll be happening on this season of Barry, but. Um, <laughs> but I will. I, I like how many episodes am I behind on Barry? I think they're up to six. And then there's like four left. Oh, uh, see, I, and I asked you and you're like, nope. Don't wait. Don't wait till the end of the season. Get in now. But it's like, do I string out the anxiety? Because it's the final season. It's like I'm sorry, the four episodes have passed and there's four more. Where to go? So so it is. It's one of those things where I you know, our friend Jenna, the writer who's been on the podcast, uh, she about five or six years ago made the decision I'm only watching shows that are wrapped up. Like, and not, oh, I'm going to wait to the end of the season. No, she will start watching Maisel 
after the end of the season. So she she's will never seen watching. Lost because they've never wrapped that show up. They, you know, <laughs> are they in purgatory? No, they're not in purgatory. Yeah, they're in purgatory. They're yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, man. Wait, wait, you know, can, can we? Uh, uh, we're not fooling anybody. It, it was still a great <laughs> show, but uh, but yeah, no. So I, 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 I. I it was a hard watch last season. I don't do well with anxiety, but I'm like, Barry's not going to die. Barry's not going to die. Barry's not going to die. Uh, I, I, I can't say that now, <laughs> you know. Right. And and based on what we know, and I don't think I'm spoiling anything. Um, I don't think this is going to have a Robert Kraft in Florida massage parlor happy ending. <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> I think. I think there's going to be some. Uh, there are some there are some surprises i will tell you that there are some, it's already the fourth episode in you know but there are some huh okay you know like there's yeah when barry wraps up you do have to go back and watch um shrinking on um yeah HBO Plus. and like i said the cliffhanger that they left you with season two it's a lighthearted show with some hard, hard moments. It's a lighthearted show. It's a Romney, I think. I think the kids might call it, um, but it's not dark, you know. But season two, there's they, <laughs> they they, uh, they put them they painted them. I don't know if they painted themselves in the corner. Obviously, they did it on purpose. But season two tonality, tonality tonality will have to be vastly different than season one because of how season two different you know what i mean uh -huh. it, it, it's like and speaking know. of harrison ford um how was your uh may may the fourth uh, you know so i did stand up and and one of the bits i do you know, and you and you've seen it before. I talk about dating apps and how my wife doesn't need a dating app. Her friends are only looking for what she already has. Well, not what she has specifically. Let's go with some upgrades. But they just want what you have. They want somebody to build a life with. They want somebody to grow old with. They want somebody to constantly mansplain them Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Everybody laughs. Well, some people laugh. Hopefully, and then <laughs> and then I'm like. I know what the ladies like. So I did that bit and I'm wearing a my my Millennium Falcon shirt. It's just a, the silhouette of the Millennium Falcon. Yes. It does glow in the dark. This t-shirt right here. Oh, nice. Okay. So I'm like, yeah, you know, Millennium Falcon. And then I turn to just a random girl who's sitting in front of him like, oh, the Millennium Falcon, interesting enough, was built by the Carillion Engineering Company. It's a light speed freighter. It's known for doing the castle run in 12 parsecs. Now, what's interesting about that is parsecs is a, a measurement, measurement of, of distance, distance, not, not time. time. Now, no. you know, <laughs> and, and, and then I'm like, I'm like, and then I snap out. I was like, sorry, I'm sorry. And I turned around, I was like, Sorry, I'm taken. <laughs> you know, and it worked. It actually went over pretty good. So that's how I spent my uh, my May the Fourth be with you. Management, on the other hand, screwed up really. Uh, first of all, she didn't see that set. I was straight fire. Uh, but she decided she's had so much going on. She hasn't seen her best friend in a while. Uh, her best friend has tomorrow off which she you know she she works at the stone Sue, so she she's one of those up at 4 30 in the morning type people so this is a one night they can go out and their favorite restaurant is uh the border cafe uh the border cafe in cambridge they closed down two years ago but they're still the one on route one in saugus and in burlington if anybody's paying attention and that's where they went tonight and then my wife realized it's Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> yeah. Oopsie daisy. Maybe not the best time to go to one of the only real pseudo like Tex-Mex restaurants. I like uh, the real pseudo. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you know what? It'll be festive. I, I have a theory that's been borne out. The further away you get from Mexico, the less authentic the mexican food <laughs> look if people in the kitchen look like me you're not in a mexican restaurant you know and and, and it's funny because you know uh i like their quesadillas no <laughs> seriously the, 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 the tacos oh my god yeah. you mm. oof. 
I could eat a case of tacos. I like their fajitas too. <laughs> no, it's funny because uh, my youngest son, whose life is now football, uh, F U T B A L L, his two best friends are, uh, you know, one it one is of Portuguese Brazilian descent. Mom's from Portugal. Dad's from Portugal. Mom's from Brazil. And his other friend. Will they ever get along? Oh, no. <laughs> mom, mom and dad are from you know brazil and th th these boys are the only english speakers in the house and it's 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 so nice that you know we have the translation apps but it's so hard to fucking feed these kids when they come over because my kids love beans and rice gringo here making <laughs> some beans and rice with like off the shelf you know taco seasoning taco seasoning right ain't the same like these kids come over with their own food that, yeah uh, it's like my... where's the linguisa oh. uh, where are the favage you know oh my god you know it, it was funny i was thinking about like my childhood because i grew up in i'm portuguese my father's from the azores my mother's from cambridge but she's portuguese but the and... portuguese part of cambridge exactly right which was you know east cambridge and um yeah, I remember going to these what they called the Portuguese American Civic League. Um, you know, like they were like, it was a it was a, like a like the water buffalo of the Portuguese community, but it was fun cuz like they had like dances and stuff and get-togethers and that was like a social event like in the 80s. That's where like all the Portuguese kids would hang out and you know, commiserate and eat like nice greasy rich Portuguese food. You know, right. like, and I and, and then locked a memory thinking about like, oh yeah, I haven't had fava beans in like the longest time. I haven't had linguisa in the longest time. You know, I just like or like that that like that beef stew that my father would make. Like all these old like bad for you food. Not to not to say that I'm eating healthy. By the way, I'm going. I'm thinking of this on my way to a Wendy's drive through. You know? <laughs> like I'm not. <laughs> no, it be it be. When's the last time you've had some real authentic Portuguese food? Uh, I mean, maybe at a funeral. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember the last time, you know, like a family gathering of sorts, you know, but not, like, not even not even for like Thanksgiving do they we have like authentic Portuguese food, you know, because we're like so Americanized, you know, it's like. No, it's it's like, you know, it's it's, you know, my brother in law, he was he was a cook forever. I mean, he was the number one go to most requested, like, you know, grill cook at the Hillstop Steakhouse ever. And and, I, and I'm not kidding. When they tried to branch out and open a, a place down in Hartford, they sent him down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but even he, when he makes his Colombian food, he's like, it's not the same. It's, you know, the way the way the meat's cured down there before it gets to the store, the way. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, there's Colombian stores, there's this stores, there's that stores, but it's not the same. And it's, there's been all these studies and you've seen and, and there's some psychological thing in people's brains. Like they won't have a certain food from childhood for 40 years. Oh, it's the ratatouille thing at the end right, of the movie yes. where like no, the critic unlocks a memory from his childhood after eating something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th there's a huge sense of memory connected with taste. My, my, my aunt... I, I spent every other weekend with this aunt and uncle, you know, growing up. And my aunt's parents were, were from Italy. Like, for you know, she's first generation. She never lived more than three blocks of where she grew up. And she lived to almost like 95. She used to make this thing called pasta fissu. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I wasn't the fattest kid in the world. Oh, right. I Gate it seven days a week for eight <laughs> hours. Uh, and and you've heard people joke about this with different cultures. And and from my experiences, the Italian people that I was like the closest to, if you don't want any more food, you know, say I don't want any more food, you're gonna get a little food. That's the and, that's the Ray Romano bit. But it's true. Yeah. So my aunt would be like, you have to finish that bowl. You have to finish that bowl. I would finish that bowl. Oh, you like it. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's if like... you really don't want any more food, then you're going to have to shoot my mother. I mean, you, you don't just graze <laughs> yeah. her because that's yes. just going to make her angrier. I know. You, now that you're saying it, yes, that's the <laughs> bit that's going through my head. But honestly, you would take your last spoonful. And as your last spoonful was making its way to your mouth of the bowl, she was making the ladle from the pot of the stove. <laughs> and my dad, 
who is a, a chef and lives to cook and has traveled around the world and speaks seven languages, he swears on Batman that my aunt never really gave him the recipe. Like my aunt would write it down so many times and would show him, he would come over and say, oh, I use this spice and I use this. And, I, she, and it, he never got it. It's like she when he took it to the grave with her. I, I swear. And he, it was, it's, if you ask Gordo, like to list his three biggest regrets and disappointments in life, he never got Mary Gillis's, uh, who's, Made a name was Giggy. <laughs> mm. I wish he had hyphenated. I went back then. It was like Mary Giggy Gillis. <laughs> uh, but but literally she did. She took it to the grave with her uh, of that. And and I haven't had it. If I had a friend whose grandma, you know, was was off the boat and and here and made it and i had it i bet i would be the guy at the end of ratatouille where where that um but yeah no it's like so these when these kids come over circling back to that it's like yeah you know uh and it's funny because where we live there's so many great places and i was taking the boys to to football practice a couple weeks ago and it got pushed by an hour so i just put in, into my map it's like Brazilian restaurant. It's the first time I've seen this kid really eat. I mean, he'll eat pizza, but doesn't like it. He'll eat this. He's a sweetheart kid. Absolutely love him. At that restaurant, it was pseudo buffet, which I'm a little uneasy about after the pandemic. Alleged. We, what didn't kill us only makes us stronger, right? But but this kid, and again, it was a Brazilian restaurant with people speaking Portuguese. <laughs> Behind the counter and in front of the counter. Wow. <laughs> it was a hole in the wall. Yeah. Best play. I, and 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 even even my little guy liked it. And we were driving the other day, and my little guy's like, Do we have time to go to that same restaurant? I'm like, we don't today, but maybe we'll go after Saturday's game. But uh, I can't spice food for them. Look at me. Like, yeah. I know. know. Um, but uh you know what? I, I think that's a you're like the, you're you're the cooler. Of uh, you know, right. ethnic yes. foods like when yes. they need when foods get too spicy, they call you in from the bullpen and they say, yeah. "Hey, can you bland uh, this up for us?" Well, I do love we like like you know, like I said, and, and again, it, it sounds so snobbish when I say this. It's like I used to love, and I still, you know, when I was a band and you got free fruit when you played the Middle East Cafe, and I started being a vegetarian in '89, and we start playing there in '1991. Not a lot of vegetarian options, but I got falafel sandwiches from there, which were great until I moved to Doha, Qatar. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, oh, what? Yeah, yeah, like you, you were awakened. So. You know, it is. It's it's uh yeah, I you know, we're wrapping it up. I'll say that's my parenting tip, you know. Have your children become friends with ethnic children so that <laughs> they get exposed to food that your your pale palate won't uh, you know, don't doesn't have the wherewithal or the abilities or the spice rack to right. make it happen. That's culture you can appropriate. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, um, I second that my, um, my parenting tip is to listen to Jacques parenting tips. That's my parenting tip this time around. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, Biff couldn't be here, but you know, I guess there's some sort of sport ing event happening that needed to be watched by him. I'm guessing. And maybe he, let me check the text thread and see how many, see what number is next to the bubble. Oh, only eight. That's fine. Not, not a, not a big, uh, not a big thing happening on the, uh, on the FNH text thread. By the way, thanks for roping me into a text thread that you've since abandoned. But I, <laughs> I really appreciate that. But hey, you know what? Um, this too shall pass. Um, you know, maybe sports will someday come back. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe never. Uh, Jacques shaking his head vigorously. He's holding up a big sign that says "No fucking way." And um, you know what? I couldn't be happier. 
I'm going to do the dance of joy that my friend Jacques has finally come completely onto the other side of nerddom. You know, he was riding the fence. Oh, I'm a jock. No, now I'm a nerd. No, now you're a full time nerd, baby, all the way. Um, you know, gain an extra 50 pounds, pounding away those snacks. <laughs> no exercise for you. It's just sitting around playing games, watching TV, uh, milk chugs, more like milk chugs than milk duds. Um, how do they call them milk duds when everyone is a winner? They're not, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> I've yet to find an actual dud. I seem to have struck a chord or broke a brain, one or the other. But anyways, before Jacques loses consciousness, I want to remind him, don't forget 